ชินตาเตสันทิเวชฟาเฟจีเชจงสันชินจามิวฟาลุนจาตาหัวมันรู้ฮะเลี้ยวสันทอสลีคูเตลสุจันหูสันเรียนสังกะเรียกรีวิชิวเอาเอาคอมเพรสชั่น for the sake of this assembly and all living beings please turn the wonderful dharma wheel to teach us how to live suffering and attend please and end birth and death And quickly realize none but. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo Sadanto Suje Doye Alahadi Samya Sambuto Che. Up to land, tomorrow. That's 
I was just going to say that uh, we use green colored incense today at BBM. We use green, what? green colored incense. Green colored incense. St. Patrick's Day. St. Okay. Patrick's Day. Green colored incense. Yes. This now is okay. I think I think the light has a little, somehow it makes you a really sharp contrast, and there's a shadow. You know, last night Locke brought in a huge light for Marty. It's like these, <laughs> it's like five or six feet tall, and it's like huge. <laughs> and so we can show it to you later. Maybe you can bring one of those in for your lectures. Uh, on with the matter at hand, which is investigating how the Bodhisattva um, prepares to teach. And in order to do that, we need to invoke spiritual presence. We're going to come back. When we're back on the Chinese, we're looking at page 66 and 67. Liu shi liu, liu shi qi ye. Okay. Meanwhile, we're going to go up to the title page and recite we're going to recite in chinese the homage to the buddha's flower garland sutra of great expanded teachings and the ocean-wide flower garland assembly of buddhas and bodhisattvas in chinese today we're going to listen we're going to welcome with the sound of a banjo the tune all right you ready we're going to chant this in Chinese and 
it's good to visualize a processional. You know, you were hoping that the assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas invisibly will compassionately send their energy down to Berkeley and to the Gold Coast, here to Benogan, while we investigate the sutra. Here we go. Namo da bang guang po bang yen ji Ba yen hai wei o bu sa Namo da bang guang po bang yen ji Ba yen hai o bu sa first took life in 1915, uh, 1919. How about that? My goodness. Okay, so we're looking at page 66 and 67 in our text. <clears throat> we have all this luxurious bandwidth because of a tiny modem. This, uh, it's, it's delightful to know that our lecture is coming to you courtesy of a Telstra mobile broadband. This little doohickey um, puts our speed uh, up to acceptable levels. That allows me to show you my desktop. Guanyin Bodhisattva's pond here, Billabong. And uh, I get to run the show. And also, we have later on, we've got some amazing stories to tell via pictures pictures and stories that I can show you from my desktop, which I'm happy to do. All right, here's our text. And today there's a breakthrough. Today we're going to, uh, oh, I said 66. Uh, actually, I want instead 64 and 65. <laughs> this guy right here. Xi Qi. Okay, everybody ready? Can you see that? We're going to read the whole paragraph, and ordinarily we would do call and response. I would say it, you'd say it back, but because of the gap, the, uh, it takes about a second or so for the energy to circle around. So we'll just, I'll just read it, and you all can read it along with me. We'll do it together. Okay, here we go. Ready? Yo zhi xi qi zhong zhong xiang so wei xing bu xing chi bie xiang sui qi shun xi xiang sui zhong sheng heng shun xi xiang sui ye fan nao shun xi xiang shan bu shan wu ji shun xi xiang Sui Ru Ho Yo Shun Xi Xiang Si Di Shun Xi Xiang Bu Duan Fan Nao Yuan Xing Bu She Shun Xi Xiang Shi Fei Shi Shun Xi Xiang Jian Wen Qin Jin Sheng Wen Du Jue Pu Sa Ru Lai Shun Xi Xiang Excellent. We did it. We got through the whole paragraph. Here we go. <clears throat> now this is the English, and we're on again. We're on page 65 now in our text. 
And again, same thing. We're going to read it together. And it's nice as we read together to observe the white spaces and to obey the punctuation because that tells us how to breathe. When we read together, it's a very lovely sound. And if we actually do inhale and exhale at the same places and do what the punctuation tells us, we're all in harmony as we read. Here we go, ready? All right. He also knows the various characterizations of habits. That is to say, the different attributes involved in activities or their absence. The attribute of permeation by the destinies. The attribute of permeation by the activities of sentient beings. The attribute of permeation by karma and its afflictions. The attribute of permeation by karma that is wholesome, unwholesome, or indeterminate. The attribute of permeation by engaging in further existences. The attribute of permeation in sequence. The attribute of permeation by persistent afflictions that are active from the distant past and have not yet been let go of. The attribute of permeation by things real or unreal. And the attribute of permeation by seeing, hearing, and associating with sound hearers, solitary enlightened ones, bodhisattvas, and tathagatas. All right, now that's a lot of vocabulary, but there's a pattern that I want to point out that will unlock this. Give you the key, it suddenly snaps into focus. Um, what are we talking about? For those of you who are not, uh, who are fresh to this lecture, <coughs> we're talking about how a bodhisattva, an awakened being, could be you, could be me, could be male or female, they're in school. They're learning how to teach. And the lesson, this is called the ninth stage. There's only one more to go to the 10th stage. The lesson is what? How we think, how living beings, how we ourselves turn thoughts that then move us into action. Because why our bodhisattva, if he can understand the way we think and then act, he has a chance to put us on the right track so we don't hurt so much. That's what a good teacher does, right? That's what a parent does. You want your kid to have a happy life without falling off a cliff, without dropping into the ocean, without doing all the things that parents worry about their kids, right? That think your kids. You don't want them to hurt. You don't want them to be miserable. If you could always guide their steps down the right path, wouldn't that be wonderful? Bodhisattva's got that thought. And his wish, her wish, is to understand right where the thoughts turn that then lead to action. So he's right there in the, the turning place. Now, we've had, uh, this is the next to last of 10. There have been, uh, so far we've had eight uh, descriptions, eight patterns of, of uh, things that, that uh, turn in the mind, right? And this bodhisattva is tuned in on top of these very, very fine, subtle thoughts in the mind. How, what does a thought weigh, right? Thoughts are like gone, just like that. The bodhisattva's watching. He's got super sensitivity to thoughts that move. Now, the word that popped up in this chapter, this, this passage tonight was habits, attributes, and permeation. Right? Don't be scared by these words. What does it mean? Habit is repeated action. You do it once, you do it twice, you do it three times, you do it 3,000 times. It's a habit. It's just grooved in. This is just the way we do it. I remember my mother washing her face. My mother had this amazing face washing ritual in the morning. And as a kid, I was sometimes in the bathroom, she would be scrubbing behind my ears and it would be time for her to wash her face. And she would turn on the cold water in, in winter and in summer, all the same. And she would take the water in her hands and just put it on her face. And she enjoyed it so much. And I, I just have this image of my mother putting water on her and letting it kind of run off her chin. And she would do it three or four times. 
and uh, I thought it was very elegant the way my mother washed her face. She did it the same way every single morning of her life. I would bet she saw her mother do the same thing. My guess is she was imitating her mom because it was almost a ritual, just this face washing with water, watching it drip off her chin. And uh, I really admired it because it, she just, it was clear that this was fun for her. She really liked that experience of, of cleaning with, with clear water, you know. So that's a habit. It's habitual energy. I think people stir sugar into their teacup or coffee mug the same way. Right? What do you do when you get a package of creamer or sugar at Starbucks? Do you tap it? Tap, 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 tap. Right? Do you thunk it? Thunk, 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 thunk. Right? And how do you, that's a habit. Those are habits. And how do you hold the steering wheel up? They're like, they, they hold it down at the bottom and they just turn it like this. Not a good plan, right? Other people like casually, if you're cool, you drape one hand like this over the edge and turn it this way. That, that's cool, you know? Other safe drivers do it like this, right? Other people clench the hair like that. So how do you hold your steering wheel, right? Habit, in muscular habits. Now, we say, oh yeah, ha, ha, ha. What I gathered from Master Hua, from my teacher was habits are old. And when we say old, it's lifetimes. Truly, these habit energies are not just part of this body. They, the habits create the bodies. It's not that the bodies pick up the habits. So why are we male in this lifetime and not female? Habit. Why are we female in this lifetime and not male? Habit, says Master Hua. It's really habits have incredible power to call us back. Because they're, why? Habits, as I understand them, and I'm, I'm a student of this, I don't see any more than you all, than we all see together. But occasionally you meet a teacher whose vision includes more than what's in front of him. And he would talk about habits as having incredible power to create themselves again. Kind of like, I remember, um, when uh, NASA, National Aeronautic and Space Association Administration, um, started launching rockets into space, okay? And this one, the Mariner Project, and this one, the Apollo Project, and the, they have their different missions, and one mission is to circle the moon and come back. One mission is to circle the Earth and come back, John Glenn, right? Then go up and circle the moon, and then one is to land on the moon. So they would always talk about uh, a window in space, right? A keyhole, keyhole in space. And the rocket would lift off from Cape Canaveral and then Cape Kennedy and now Cape Canaveral again. And it would go up and mathematically they would figure out exactly <coughs> where the vector force of the rocket had to be to put it right through that keyhole so it could go where they told it to be and then come back. And that they call it vector force, meaning how much strength it took to get there. That's habits. Habits have vector force. They don't just go up and they're gone. They go until they're done. So habits bring on responses later, right? They're not just over. So what does he know? He knows the characterizations the xiang, the attributes, the things we can see of, of habits, which is repeated activities. The attributes involved in activities or no attributes, meaning it's from the past. You can't see what brought that vector on. When did you, why does that person hate you? Because when you were in third grade, you punched him and embarrassed him in front of his older brother and he hated you and you forgot about it. Now it's high school and he's just been waiting all this time to get back at you, but you totally forgot that you punched him back in third grade. He didn't forget, right? That's a vector force. You, the, your fist connected with his chin, it was over as far as you were concerned. He carried that force in his heart all this time. 
he's going to get back at you. So that's what I'm talking about, right? There's action and reaction, and sometimes the timing is, is long in that. The attributes involved, permeation. Okay, what's that? The Chinese is xun xi, xun xi, which means what? Smoking, soaking. Um, Jin Husher said, you all have green incense in Berkeley today, right? In honor of St. Patrick's Day, right? No, that incense comes from Japan. That's uh, green tea incense, right? I know, you can't put, the Irish are not tea drinkers. So that's Japanese green tea incense. But on St. Patrick's Day, which actually is tomorrow, so you're still clear for a day. Here we have no excuse. We miss St. Patrick's Day here. But you have a day's grace to uh, dye all the incense green and then green sandalwood on St. Patrick's Day. So what happens when you light incense? It gets into your clothes, right? Somebody who's been in the Buddha hall can tell even when they're in the dining room. Uh, a lot of people walk in the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery Buddha Hall for the first time and go, it smells so nice in here, right? It really smells nice because why? Shunji, it's permeated with the incense that we light there many times a day, many sticks of incense. So that's permeation. Habits get smoked in. They get perfumed. Shunji means to be perfumed. So what does it say? It says, the attribute of perfuming by the destinies. What's a destiny? In this case, it's talking about the different realms of rebirth, the hell's realm, the ghost's realm, the animal's realm, okay? Then the human's realm, the Ashura, the Titan's realm, the Deva's realm. What's it saying? It says this Bodhisattva is checking out where you've been, where I've been. He can look and tell by the thoughts in your head, your heart, wherever your thoughts move, where you were last and how it affected you. Okay? So as far as you all know, everybody in Australia is walking around with umbrellas because it's wet all the time, right? No, that's not permeation. That's rare to have rain in Australia, but you saw it raining. Okay. What's another permeation by activities? I want to tell you the, um, the strange life of a monk in the Queensland bush. Uh, one hour ago, I was preparing today's lecture, figuring out about habits, and I heard this sound. And the sound was a kookaburra, and people know the kookaburras go, <laughs> they laugh like that, right? Well, no, that's not the sound. This kookaburra sound is, chirp, 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 chirp. and I heard it, I thought, I know that sound. That's what Ali used to do, my kookaburra buddy, when he wanted me to know that he was here. That's his, I'm here sound, right? So I thought, wow, that's funny. So I stood up and I looked around the corner. There was the kookaburra, a different kookaburra, a year later, giving me the same sound, which was, hi, I'm here. I'm not making this up. Sam knows that sound. In fact, I have it. I don't know if, if on the computer you all can hear. Just a minute. Let me see. I can play. You all think I'm crazy. No, no, it's true. This is kookaburra language here we go mrs ali flies no let's see ali feeds junior no ali movie clip ali greeting here it is right here ready here we go see if you can hear it that's it right there that's the sound okay one more time here we go just that Okay, that's an unusual kookaburra sound. I heard that today. And I looked around the corner, sure enough, there he was. And so I think I've learned a word in kookaburra language, whatever that was. Anyway, so he was to say, I'm here. And so I thought, oh, great, here's my chance to feed him. Because why? 
the Kurawangs were not around. And here's the drama. And this is why people in Berkeley are going to think, uh, we better bring him back. He's been there too long. This guy's gone soft in the head. Now, what is it like? The kookaburras eat one kind of food. It's I prepare veggie ham for them because they're carnivores. They like meat. They don't eat crackers. They don't eat fruit. They don't eat bird seed. They eat meat. And of course, I'm not going to feed them meat. So the best thing I have is su hotwe, right? Got veggie ham. So I wash the salt out of it, dunk it in there, wash it, wash it. I keep it in the freezer. So I warm it up with hot water and wash the salt out. Then I chop it up into bite-sized chunks and I take it out and I set it on the railing for the kookaburra. Well, that should be good, right? Not. Why? There's another couple of birds that think veggie ham is the best food they've ever, ever eaten. They're called kurawangs, and they are not afraid to get close to me. Ali, the kookaburra, is on a branch across the way. He's got to fly 50 yards to get it because he doesn't want to land next to me. The kurawangs land directly in front of me and grab the ham. And why don't I feed them too? Well, they can eat fruit. They can eat crackers. I feed them every day with bird seed, all kinds of goodies. They eat everything. And if I let them, they'll gobble up the ham first because they love it. And poor Ali will get nothing, you know. So I've got this drama. How do I get the right food to the right bird? And so sure enough, I saw Ali out there. And I went running and grabbed the ham, chopped it up, put it in the hot water, washed the salt out. Took it out, set it down, Kurawang swoops in, grabs it first, flies away. So poor Kookaburra didn't get any food. And so I'm trying to think of strategies to divert the Kurawang so I can feed the Kookaburra. And so the drama, there's another level of drama currently, which is Ali, the Kookaburra, who he is teaching how to be a full grown up kookaburra. And it's full of, of excitement. They are. This is Ali the third as a young teenager. Those of you who saw him months ago saw him as a little innocent chick. Now he's, I would turn this around, but you guys can't see it. So, no. Anyway, in Berkeley, you can see Ali the Third. We're thinking he's Oliver. Here he is. He's pretty much grown up. He's brown. He's got brown feathers. This is his dad on the left. So here's the drama. Now, what am I talking about? Why am I telling this particular story? Habits. Habits you get that permeate your behavior if you're hanging out with birds. Well, number one, be quick you have to grab your food really quick because if you don't, somebody's gonna grab it away from you, right? Number two is um, the, um, there's another habit that the kookaburras have, which is they take their food and they bang it on the tree branch. They have, their heads are very flexible. They have a, must have a U-joint a right here because they take whatever they have and go whack, whack, on the tree branch. In this case, it's on the, the railing of the, the, the porch. And what do they like to eat? They like to eat snakes. And a snake or a, a lizard, a skink, has, they're gonna, they're, they have these long, narrow beaks, right? Did you see his beak? Let's bring his beak up again. Hold on, take a look at Ollie's beak. There it is. That's a snake holding beak right there. You all can't see it. Sorry, about that. we'll show you later. And they grab the snake here and then bang it on the tree branch. And sure enough, they dash its brains out. They line it up with their beak and then go gop, 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 and swallow it down here. And then it digests over a period of time. So if you're a kookaburra, that's acceptable kookaburra behavior bashing the brains out of whatever you're eating. And over time, that becomes normal. If you're a kookaburra, that's the only way you're gonna get nutrition. So when the sutra says, 春息, 
you permeate with habits. That's what it's talking about. Now, <clears throat> we've watched the young bird get taught by the old bird how to do it. So if you're a kid, you're impressionable. The adult is the one who knows how to do it. That's a habit. You get permeated by it. So what does the sutra say? It says the attribute of permeation by the destinies, right? If you're a bird, monkey see, monkey do, right? Young bird follows old bird. He's the one who knows how to eat. I'll do it your way. That's permeation, right, over time. Uh, if your dad smoked cigars, kids are going to grow up thinking cigars are natural for adults to do, right? If your dad swears a lot, kids are going to grow up hearing profanity. That's natural, four-letter words, right? That's permeation by the destiny. Okay, the attribute of permeation by activities of sentient beings, greed, anger, delusion, right? The attribute of permeation by karma and its afflictions. What's that? There's behavior that you can see, like suppose uh, your parents are not readers. You don't have any books in the house. For you, going to the library, never been there, right? Library is like foreign turf. Uh, for somebody whose parents are big readers, they've got books at home. They see their mom and dad with a book in their hands, turning pages, making notes, putting bookmarks in, right? They get permeated by that. That's right in front of you. Some permeation happens because of the past. It comes out of you like a seed out of the ground. It's not something you saw. It's coded in from the past. Okay. Um, how far back? Well, I don't see that. But the theory says that every single thing we do, everything that we say, everything that we think, plants a seed. It comes from the past. The seeds we plant now in response carry it into the future. So how does the phrase go? Our friend Franklin uh, used this as the tagline for every email. How did it go? It was, what I've, uh, let's see, let me get it right first time. What I do, I will, let's see, what, I, what I've been, let's see, what I do is what I've done. What I do, I will become. That's, I've, I've lost one, almost. Somebody check Franklin, send him an email. Jin Chuan, you know how it goes? All, what I've done is, yeah, what I, that I blew it. So anyway, the idea is past activities bring us to the present. Present activities carry us into the future. All I've done, no, what I, oh, I know, I got it. Who I am yeah. is yeah. what I've done. What I do, I will become, right? That's yes, it. I think that's right. Yes, I think that's right. Yes, I think that's right. Yes, I think that's right. That's right. Who I am. Oh, that's worth writing down. Here we go. Are you ready? Here's our note page. Who I am is what I've done. What? Have you got it there? What I do, I will become. Whoa, we are what we have done. All right. You want to bring that up? I want to show it to you. I will become. Okay, make that bigger. Here we go. We have a karma t-shirt here. You want to bring that up? Show people. Who I am is what I, Are you ready? Okay, check this out. This came out of a luggage from Berkeley. There we go. All right. It says, we are what we have done. This is actually an XX large. This is really a big teacher. <laughs> Karma written big. We are what we have done. And you flip it around. And it says, what we do, we will become. Now, listen. Buddhist t-shirts. Speaking the principle on the spot. Pretty good. Okay, thank you for that. Hubba hubba. Okay. So, 
Who I am is a result of what I've done in the past. What I do now brings me into the future. Couldn't say it better. The power of habits. Because why? We react to things that stimulate us day after day after day after day after day. Um, does that mean it's all fixed? No. Um, how many times have you all quit coffee? Anybody here nobly, courageously try to cut coffee out of your life? How many times? Uh, Every morning, right? <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Yeah, and then we fail, right? We go back and another, yeah, like give me a latte, right? Yeah, so you can potentially, I, I made vows to get rid of sugar years and years. Jin Wei sure is sitting there in the front row looking like an awesome cultivator. He has gone through numerous reductions of sugar. Uh, you're, are you, did you go back? Did you fall off your sugar vow, Jin, Jin Wei sure? Still got it, right? Can't hear. King Bujian. Uh, maybe you need a translator. Hand, hand the mic to Jin, Jin Chuan. What, what did he say? I didn't get it. Oops. Did we lose? We lost the audio. What's going on? Mr. Engineer, can we can we get the audio back? Nope. No sound. Okay. What happened to our audio? You can hear me, right? Yes? Okay. I can't hear you. Nope. Nope. Not working. Okay, here, let's, let me, I'll type a note into my chat box. Here we go. I can't hear you, and that severely limits the jokes. Here we go. So anyway, let's let it be said. Maybe you can investigate what's wrong with your audio there. Um, I know that Jinwei sure has, uh, Followed my bad example in in uh, actually testing, trying testing. trying hard to ah there you go good good yeah okay loudly please okay there, there repeat, okay, there, master. There, I'm, repeat still master. I'm still in detox mode detox mode <laughs> you're still in detox mode good what have you noticed by reducing sugar oh uh, uh, I I am I, less sleepy am after less lunch sleepy after lunch. <laughs> Less sleepy after lunch. Uh, uh, I noticed that I noticed the fruits that has, the fruits uh, has uh, another uh, taste. Another taste when I'm eating. When I'm food eating. tastes better. Food is better. Yeah. And food is better. And yeah, yeah. It feels good. Actually. Feels good. Actually. <laughs> awesome. Feels good. Yeah. So, I admire that. I've uh, I am still adding a spoonful of sugar into my coffee. But I remember the time. The point of this. The point of the exercise is to say what. When I was about 15, I thought coffee smelled terrible. I couldn't, I drank a cup of coffee and it was like, blah, it's bitter, it's fiery, who wants this, you know? And then, uh, as a monk, didn't, at the time, coffee wasn't a big thing. Tea, on the other hand, drank a lot of tea, but not coffee. And then I became a graduate student and writing my doctoral dissertation, somebody said, drink this. And I drank a cup of coffee and it was like, oh, I think I see the point. I said, yeah, more of that, please. I'll have another cup. And so began to, to appreciate coffee. But then uh, as soon as you realize that habits have control of you, it's not so much that it's, it's you're controlling the habit, the habit is now dictating you're not happy without the object or without the drink or without the the uh, trip to Las Vegas or Reno wherever whatever the habit is so that's the idea of the power of habits and Master Hua had a statement he said desire and principle 
fight in the mind. Habit will decide the winner. So it's natural because we're living beings, desire rises up. We see something outside, looks good, I want it, right? Principle says, actually, you've got one. It's a little old, it's the same old, but it's still good. And the only thing that's changed is your greed. Don't, don't go for it. Desire tries to get a lawyer, and the lawyer tries to argue why you should. And principle says, no, that's not. Last time you went for it, it didn't make you happy, right? Even though you got it, you didn't want it after you got it. And desire, yeah, but, yeah, but. And he says, habit will decide the winner. That's cultivation. Desire and principle fight in the mind. Habit will decide who wins. Are we going to listen to our wisdom? We're going to listen to our desire. Good friends matter a lot in that, in that interaction. The attribute of permeation by karma that is wholesome, karma that is unwholesome, karma that is indeterminate, which is what? You're determined that you're going to go spend some time with your kids after work, and one of your colleagues comes over and says, hey, let's go play video games and drink a six-pack, and you go, right? It's the importance of friends and habits are so powerful. The attribute of permeation by engaging in further existences. That's what I do, I will become. The attribute of permeation in sequence. Some habits just follow one after the other because you, took, you, you went and took a drink, then you went and played cards. Because you played cards, you lost the money that was going to vacation. Because you lost the money, vacation, you had a fight with your spouse etc etc sequence the attribute of permeation by persistent afflictions that are active from the distant past and haven't been let go of how powerful are habits the attribute of permeation by things real or unreal the attribute of permeation by seeing hearing and associating with sound hearers solitary buddhas bodhisattvas and tathagatas so drawing near wholesome friends, they influence us. Okay, um, true confessions time. Talk about sweet tooth. Everybody know the phrase sweet tooth? Chinese, how do you say sweet tooth in Chinese? Gan lu, sweet tooth, not sweet do. Sweet tooth. A sweet tooth? What's a sweet tooth? Do you know? Is that, is that a Midwestern? Is that another Irish idiom on St. Patrick's Day? What's a sweet tooth? Do you know? Some of y'all sweet tooth. It's funny because why? Chinese desserts don't... Who knows? We've got it. Chan,嘴,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,喝着,
food. Food was your first defense. You ate a lot of sugar and fat to keep yourself warm. It's how you cope. So my grandmother, I always remember my grandmother in her apron with flour on her hands because she baked every single day. Kao mian bao, kao tian ping. Ah, she, nigga, she baked every single day. She would, after breakfast, breakfast was what? Breakfast was pancakes, waffles with maple syrup, real maple syrup for maple trees, uh, Canadian bacon, ham, biscuits with honey and butter, oatmeal with fruit on top at, from a can because there was no fruit in Quebec. So <clears throat> that was breakfast, right? As soon as everybody went off to school or to work, she would put on her apron, dust flour on the breadboard and start to bake. So my dad grew up uh, having endless amounts of sweet things to eat, plum pudding, right? And uh, fruit cake and pies and cakes and cobblers and all of these goodies. So he came down to America during after the Second World War and became a lawyer and it wasn't that cold and that amount of sugar that he was in the habit of eating plus an, a war injury ruptured his pancreas and his insulin balance was out of balance. So my dad, as a result, couldn't touch sugar. If he ate sugar, it would kill him. Uh, he, and he had to use insulin every single day. Okay, my mom was a good dietitian, And so if we had any kind of dessert after dinner, it was like fruit cocktail out of a can or peach slices or, uh, you know, a slice of pound cake, but never the kind of things that I saw my my neighbors, my, my classmates, my friends were eating cakes and pies and candies and Coke and candy bars and all the stuff that was natural for kids to eat. So as a result, uh, I would sneak into my kids, my brothers, I would sneak into my best friend's kitchen and look at his counter and sneak donuts and sneak cake and pies. And I only found out later that his mom knew that I was doing that. And, well, that's Chris, you know, they don't have any of this at their house, so it's okay. All right. So I grew up not realizing that I had a craving for sweets. And it was because I, they weren't available to me growing up. So I get to Gold Mountain Monastery, mm, San Francisco, and guess what? Monks don't get to choose what they eat. We eat what people offer. That's what called being a bhikshu, right? Well, suddenly I realized that I had this huge craving for sugar. I had no idea that as soon as I left my mother's kitchen, I was in the habit of going to the grocery store and buying candy bars and and ice cream and things like that. It didn't seem strange to me that I was doing this until I couldn't, suddenly. We ate one meal a day, and if there was anything sweet, it might be fruit, or it was Chinese, you know, uh, what is it, dou sha, dou sha de dong xi. It's not like European pastry, you know, it's bean sand, and it's, you know, so anyway. Here I was in Gold Mountain Monastery with this raging sweet tooth. I had no idea, simply because I couldn't. And it was basic desire that had just been channeled into this fantasy. I would be meditating and I'd be thinking about, you know, Mars bars, Three Musketeers, or Snickers. You translate those, Cliff? Do you know what Snickers? No, no. Candy bar. In Australia, I'm sure there's the equivalent. And I'd be dreaming about jelly donuts and apple pie with ice cream on top and chocolate cake with cherry frosting and, you know, all the things that, that I didn't realize that I had developed this craving for because as a kid I couldn't, 
eat them. So when I became a college student, I was indulging in sweets. Became a monk, couldn't suddenly. Okay, so I got a, I announced to my mother that I was going to leave home and officially become a monk. And this awareness of my sweet tooth happened living in the monastery. I wasn't yet a bhikshu, but I was living the way I would as soon as I left home, train, trying it out. And so my mother sent me uh, a, uh, a card with $5 in it. And this is, you know, 1974, $5 went a lot farther. And so I was thinking, wow, $5. You know what? You know what's on my mind? I'm thinking, wow, last chance. After this $5 is spent, that's it. Then I become a monk and no more sweets, no more sugar. Well, it was 4th of July. This was not a birthday gift. It was a just an ordinary uh my mother sent it to me because I was going to leave home. So, all right. Fourth of July, holiday. And it was a Saturday. Master Hua was going to lecture twice, once after lunch and once in the evening. And so here's, I opened this letter, $5. Oh, my gosh. Well, I'm going to become a monk. So what should I do with this $5? And I thought, well, you know, just down Albion Street, there's a cookie shop. Uh, and it's a San Francisco Mission District cookie shop that also has baklava, Greek pastry, that honey is sweet with walnuts. Oh, man. And further, not only does it have baklava, it's got all these Italian like ices and juices and yummy stuff and cookies in the window. And oh boy, and I think, yeah, this is what I'll do. This is my chance, my last chance to really get some, you know, quality San Francisco cookies before I leave home. So, oh, in my mind, you know, lunchtime, and the lecture starts at 12:30. Actually, the Dabe uh, Chan before the lecture, and so it's now quarter of 12 and I've got to be back by 12:30. So, I'm looking left and looking right and you know, fa sa so so la si ju so so zo jie ban ju ju fo fa jie zai, right? You going bow to the Buddha, boom, out the door, running down Albion Street, you know, $5 in my hand, sweaty, you know, dripping. So like running and thinking, what's it going to be? I think I'll, I'll buy a lot and I'll bring them back and give them to everybody, you know. Turn around the corner, skidding around, push the door of the cookie shop, bang! <laughs> Closed for 4th of July. <laughs> I've got the screen door imprinted in my nose, you know, and I'm looking and I'm seeing all the cookies there and locked and lights are out. So, oh man, I turn back and I slowly walk up Albion Street and I'm thinking, what kind of Bodhi resolve is this? You're j this is a cookie resolve. You found the unsurpassed cookie resolve. No, that's totally, you're a crummy cultivator. You're no good as a Buddhist. What? How sad. You really ought to be ashamed of yourself for thinking only of your own sweet tooth you know, why don't you leave home today? Why wait until tomorrow? You could really cultivate if you'd let that go. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to take this $5 and I'm going to put it in the, the, in the offering box and I'm done. Whatever last cookie I ate, that was the last one. And I'm just like dragging my steps and I'm looking at my watch. You have five minutes to line up for Sherpa's lecture. And I come around the corner and I push the door open to Gold Mountain and I can't push it open because why? There's a monk standing there wearing yellow robes and a wool cap. And it's Master Hua standing in the doorway. And I'm, I'm feeling about this big, you know, <laughs> like, oh, what a, just pushed around by my desires. How sad. Master Hua looks at me, 
He goes, cookie? <laughs> and he hands me two cookies, kind that I really like. And I, I just, I just cried, you know, because he said, it's okay, cookies, he said. And turned around and walked away. And it was like, I thought, oh, I think I'll wrap these in plastic and never eat them. I'll just keep these forever. <laughs> these are, sure, it was magic cookies, you know. But I didn't. I ate them. I ate them both. Oh. <laughs> uh. And I did. I put the $5 in the offering box. But boy, did I understand the power of habit, right? Habits turn you into a monkey or into a kurawang that will eat everything. Doesn't matter. He wants veggie ham bad, right? So, oh my goodness. So that's the true story of the power of habits. And I wish I could say that was the last that uh, that I was the last that I was in, uh, permeated by the perfume of desire. But it's not, unfortunately. Now I have another photo for everybody to take a look at because. We're talking about habits, and yesterday, Sam and I uh, grabbed our cameras, and we went running down to the office, because why? We saw something that we'd been looking for for a long time, and there they were. They're called glossy black cockatoos, Take a look at the glossy black cockatoo and talk about habits. There's a glossy black cockatoo. This bird eats one food, casserina nuts, which are right there in the picture. That's what they eat and they grab them with their claws that look just like fingers of a hand, hold them up to their beak, and crack them. That's an amazing bird. They're huge, and they're rare. They're endangered. And we have two of the finest glossy black cockatoos, a couple, on our property. And the amazing thing is to realize that's what they eat. They eat those. And you can't force them. They wouldn't eat a cookie, even if it came from Master Hua. Right? They're, so what is it about these seeds? And furthermore, they like the casserina nuts from two particular trees. There they are. That's husband and wife, and that's what they eat. I, I wish I could turn these around to show you. You didn't come to lecture last night, or you would have seen all these pictures. See? <laughs> oh, man. Here they are. Check out that animal. They eat one kind of food, and there it is. And it grows on those two trees. And they come around once a year, and we get to see them. Luckily, yesterday, it was clear and uh, Sam and I got our lenses on these birds. How strange, right? Talk about permeated by habits. And you can't get them to eat anything else but that. So, isn't that something? Who would have thunk it? Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, let's take, let's go, we have one more chunk here. And we're done with <coughs> the training of the Bodhisattva. And what is this paragraph about? It's about Ding. Ding, we're going to translate as meditative focus. I wish you all could see, before we do that, I'm going to hold on here. Just a minute. We're going to remove that. Uh, finders using it, thank you. 
Okay. What I want people to see is the effect of the rain on our garden. With the rain dripping down. Isn't that lovely? It's raining here in Queensland. Thank goodness. Here we are. All right. So what we're looking at now is the next thing the Bodhisattva is going to pay attention to, which is how skillfully the people that he wants to teach are at Ru Ding, learning how to meditate. <coughs> He's looking at Zheng Ding and Xie Ding and Bu Ding. Right meditative focus, wrong meditative focus, and meditative disfocus, unfocused, right? Lack of meditative focus. That's the topic. And the Bodhisattva wants to know that because if he can figure out how skillful your mind is, he can help you wake up sooner. Okay, let me read it. Here we go. Um, Cliff, we are on the bottom of 64 going on to 66, right? Yo zhi zhong sheng zheng ding xie ding bu ding xiang so wei zheng jian zheng ding xiang xie jian xie ding xiang er ju bu ding xiang wu ni xie ding xiang wu gan zheng ding xiang er ju bu ding xiang ba xie xie ding xiang Zheng Xing Ding Zheng Xing Zheng Ding Xiang Geng Bu Zuo Er Ju Li Bu Ding Xiang Shen Zuo Xie Fa Xie Ding Xiang Xi Xing Sheng Dao Zheng Ding Xiang Er Ju She Bu Ding Xiang Okay, there we go. Thank you for that. Here's the English. Anybody wants to join me? Here we go. He or she also knows the attributes of right meditative focus, wrong meditative focus, and lack of meditative focus of sentient beings. That is to say, the attribute of right views and right meditative focus, the attribute of wrong views and wrong meditative focus, the attribute of neither right nor wrong methods reaching meditative focus, the attribute of the five cardinal misdeeds and wrong meditative focus. The attribute of five fundamental qualities and right meditative focus. The attribute of neither of those qualities reaching meditative focus. The attribute of wrong meditative focus involving the eight wrong views. The attribute of right meditative focus of the right nature. The attribute of preventing their enactment so both are left behind and there is no concentration. The attribute of wrong meditative focus, a profound attachment to wrong dharmas. The attribute of right meditative focus, of practicing the path of sages. And the attribute of there being no meditative focus, since both are abandoned. Okay, now ordinarily, reading all those words, people's minds just go, tilt, I can't hold all that stuff. What is right meditative focus? Here's the way I think. To approach this and why we can uh, make sense of this. This is training for a bodhisattva. He is like a doctor, she is like a doctor in that she's going to be dealing as a teacher with all these living beings. And all these living beings come from right? from all directions having all kinds of habits, all kinds of abilities, all kinds of obstacles, the Bodhisattva's got to take one look at them and figure out how to teach them in a way that helps, that makes sense, just like a doctor. Right? Chinese doctors do this, right? They go, they 
touch the pulse, right? They take a pulse, they do it this way or that way. And they can tell you what's wrong with your heart, your liver, your kidneys, your spleen, your lungs, your stomach. Shingan Pi Shen. They know exactly what you've done in the past and what's weak and what's strong. The Bodhisattva wants to do that with your life, not just your body, but everything about your life. And what he is reading is your habits and your abilities, your potentials. But there's one more piece of it that is makes it such a neat Buddhist text, which is what? This Bodhisattva knows how good you are at meditation. Can you approach Zheng Ding? meditative focus in the past we would have said dhyana samadhi but meditative focus i think is i know um ajahn amaro and pasano were saying that in the thai forest tradition they're trying to get rid of the word concentration because concentration sounds tightening instead of what it is is relaxing extremely relaxed so if you can focus it's just more like a camera lens just finding that sharp focus so there that's a new translation of thing right meditative focus how you can come into sharp relief all right if you can do that the bodhisattva's work is much easier much easier depending on how you can come into focus how still and quiet your mind is so that's another piece and I think it's so interesting that he's using that as one of the things he's measuring you by is are you a meditator if you are he can teach you much more quickly or she can right so master Hua look what master Hua had to work with sweet tooths he had to work with people addicted to sugar and Bodhisattva wants to know if you've got access to stillness how many pieces of your mind have you integrated into a bigger whole right uh, and look at the choices look at the choices some people have got shitting right some people have got wrong views but well, how did it go the first was Zheng Ding, Xie Ding, Bu Ding, Xiang. The attributes of right meditative focus, wrong meditative focus, and no meditative focus at all. Lack of, right? Bu Ding. What would be wrong meditative focus? Obsession. You ever see a cat outside a mouse hole? Anybody have mouse holes? When I, that's always a classic picture as a cat, you know perched outside the mouse hole waiting for the mouse to come out as soon as the mouse sticks his nose out the cat boom, right so waiting for the mouse to appear so you can eat it that would be shedding okay you're really focused but your focus is desire based because you're you want to eat you want to kill for the cat I mean that's cat's food if you're a cat uh, so she I guess is in the lives of the beholder if you're a cat, that's really proper. Zheng Ding, I suppose, like that. Um, people, we talk about obsession. You are just so attached to something that day and night, all you can do is think about that desired object or person. That's an obsession. That would be a Xie Ding. <clears throat> I think from the point of view of advanced meditation, Chan meditation, um, not letting go of your focus would be she there's coarse she and there's subtle she she being crooked wrong right um, I'll give an example we're gonna come back to this section next week unpack the different kinds of meditation meditative focus then we're done and that's the tenth one and the bodhisattva becomes what a great dharma master a da fa shi 
And what he develops is eloquence. Eloquence. All right. So here's my story. We'll, we'll conclude with this today. Um, Professor Lancaster loved to tell this story at UC Berkeley. And they wanted to distinguish correct Chan meditation from incorrect Chan meditation. And so they found three individuals and took them into a laboratory. They took the first person, and that person was a non-meditator. And they hooked him up to an EKG machine. And this is a machine that measures brain waves, right? What's how your brain is sparking. <coughs> and so they took the person, and next to the person, they all set up in the beep, 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 beep on the oscilloscope. And so they took two pieces of wood next to the person's ear and went like that and went on clapping. Right? And then they looked at the brain waves. And how do you imagine the brain waves on the oscilloscope and the EKG machine went? They went spike, 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 flat. What did the person do? He gradually blocked them out. Right? Anybody live next to a train, a railroad? In a month, you don't hear the trains go by, right? The first month, oh, it's so noisy. After a month, what do you do? You don't hear them anymore. Anybody ever lived next to a fish market? Anybody been to Gold Buddha Monastery in Vancouver, the old Gold Buddha on Hastings Street? East Hastings, right next door to a fish market. We didn't smell it after a month. Remember? Yeah. So as soon as you go away for a while and you come back, oh, especially when the deliveries come. On a hot summer day, the truck pulls up and oh, it stinks, right? And then after a while, what fish market, right? You get accustomed to it. So ordinary people who don't meditate just block it out over time. Okay, next person, number two, comes in. Who is this person? This is a yogi. The yogi practices yogic Hindu-style meditation. And what do they do? They're very good at controlling their senses. They ru ding. They go into what from the Buddhist point of view is wrong, samadhi. They hold their senses with strength so they don't react. So hook him up, put him on the EKG, deep, deep, deep. What do they do? Clap, 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 clap. What does his EKG look like? Nothing. Because they can hold their senses to not react. But they're doing it with strength, right? They dull their eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. It works. It's a kind of samadhi, right? Okay, so they take that down. Number three, here comes the Zen meditator. Chan, Chan Zuo, Da Zuo, San Chan. Here's the Buddhist meditator practicing Chan. Okay, hook him up to the EKG. Beep, beep. Right? Ready? Here we go. Clap, clap, clap. Clap, clap, clap. What do you think the spike looked like? Spike, 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 spike. Every single time the sound was made, the meditator heard it clearly, sensitively, didn't block it out over time, didn't block it off with strength, just fresh every time, not attached. Oh, that's a nice sound. That's the sound. I hear the sound. That's the sound, right? Fresh, unattached, clean, sensitive. So that's Jung Ding, right concentration. You're focused. You hear everything perfectly, not attached to it, not hating 
the nice sound, or loving the nice sounds, hating the bad sounds, right? So, meo wang shang. You just hear it all completely. So, Professor Lancaster loved to tell that story about what is right samadhi is everything is fresh. You don't attach to it. You're alive in the moment completely. Okay, so far so good. That's Zheng Ding and Xie Ding and Bu Ding Xiao. Next week, we will continue to look into different kinds of samadhi, meditative focus, and we'll uh, be done with the Bodhisattva's education in preparation for him becoming, her becoming a great Dharma master. Okay, um, while, we're, while I've got you here, I think we've had a world-shaking tragedy in Christchurch um, where our delegation is going in a few days to New Zealand. And uh, we went to the mosque yesterday. Could, could somebody, could Sam, would you mind turning this on? Um, we had a prayer gathering at the mosque and uh, it was it helped the the mosque is in a rundle up near surfers paradise in broad beach and uh, there were hundreds of people there the constables were there the police and all the different interfaith guests were there and just showing up uh, gave support better than the words the words are always the same platitudes we're all in this together you know it's the behavior that counts the most and all of our entire group went up to uh, show our solidarity with people and the um, it came home to me the power of music to heal and the uh, came up with a song that was healing back then and is healing now and your part should you care to join is the answer my friend is blowing in the wind the answer is blowing in the wind. Um, the question is, to my mind, pointing directly at myself, what is it about Northern European white men that violence is our answer? That's an important question, because in America, where I come from, and now in Australia, uh, Northern European white men are the problem. They're dangerous. So I ask myself these questions. If anybody would like to join me, the chorus goes, The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. Nine questions in this song. How many roads must a man walk down before you call him a man or a woman? How many seas must a white dove sail before she sleeps in the sand? Yes, and how many times must the cannonballs fly before they are forever banned. Join me. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. How many years can the mountain exist before it is washed to the sea? 
How many years can some people exist before they're allowed to be free? Yes, and how many times can a man turn his head pretending he just doesn't see? Here we go. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. Here we go. How many times must a man look up before he can see the sky? Yes, and how many ears must one man have before he can hear people cry? How many deaths will it take till he knows that too many people have died? Here we go. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. So thanks to Bob Zimmerman, Bob Dylan, for providing that song. for asking those questions. Uh, Jin Chuan, I'll break out dedication of merit here if you want to announce anything that the Berkeley community needs to know at this time. We have the nuns we tomorrow, the nuns tomorrow uh, Sunday evening uh, Sunday at Berkeley evening Monastery. Berkeley Monastery. Um, okay, the nuns are coming tomorrow. The, the, the Theravada nuns. The Theravada nuns. And, yep. on and Monday, on Monday, I think we have our regular, I think we have our regular yoga, and yoga and Qigong. Wednesday, we have, Wednesday, the we have the Stephen Tainer side Stephen class. Tainer Thursday, the class. East Bay Inside Meditation. Inside meditation. And, Friday, and Friday, um, um there'll be lecture. There'll and be then lecture. Saturday, then Saturday, Saturday, will be our lecture, 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 lecture like usual. So I think we have a so regular we have week a next regular week. week next week. Regular week of full of that events. Okay. Um, due to the determined persistence of the monks at Berkeley Monastery, led by Dharmaster Jinfo, our sidewalk has now been successfully replaced. You don't have to worry about tripping off, the falling off the edge of the sidewalk or stumbling over the tree roots. It's all nice and clean and smooth. It took three dump trucks full of cement, is that right? Yes, that's right. Three. Yes, that's right. Right, three. Sangha. Right, Sangha. Three. 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 Yes. Three. Three entire yes. cement trucks. Yeah. yeah, laid down a lot of cement. Changgong la ha, chin fo shi ra. Chuan, chuan, zuo de fei chang bu chou la. Yeah. Ah, uh, mm. zhe yang zi. We found a Vietnamese contractor, and A Gong, you were in there sweating with everybody and supervising, right? <laughs> yeah, we got the supervisor here with us. You're not going to get him back. We have work for him here in Australia. So, <coughs> so okay, but that's uh, a long project, and it turned out to be so complicated just to break out the old sidewalk and pour it again because we had to bring in three government departments to because we had to chop the tree roots. That's the forestry department. We had to make sure that there weren't any cables or wires or pipes underneath, that's the uh, public works department. We had to get permits, that's another department. So, but wow, a lot of work. Yeah. Now it's all done. And there's an important job, which is keeping the kids from putting their handprints in the wet cement. That's an important job. Okay. All right. So let's dedicate the merit and we'll consider this one lecture closer. Uh, pretty soon, we're going to find out about the great Dharma master of the Avatamsaka, the ninth stage. 
All right, please make a wish, make a better world, a world where the human species doesn't exterminate itself. If people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving beauty, may our minds away to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. A kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of their endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and one. May all become compassionate and one. May it be so. We're greeted by a clap of thunder here in the Gold Coast. See you all next week. Aumi Tofu. Bye bye, everyone.